Amen. All right. Hello, church. Welcome to week five. We are uh, past the halfway point on this class, so that's good. Some of you have been here every week, and I see some new faces, too, so uh, that's really exciting. Hopefully, uh, it's been a blessing, and it's been interesting. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about polygamy, which is uh, the one thing that um, most people think about when they think about Mormonism. Sometimes people don't know anything at all about the history of Mormonism, but they somehow know that polygamy is somehow a part of it. So uh, maybe that's fair, maybe that's not, not fair. Uh, so, but um, I think we're going to see why, how it's been a pretty big part of their history and why it kind of still uh, lingers over their religion to this day. Um, I understand that we're live streaming tonight, so that's exciting. Uh, welcome to the live, live streaming crowd uh, on Facebook. So if you missed the uh, first four, you can go back to my YouTube channel. I have a reference to it later on, but uh, we talked about the history of Mormonism. We went a little bit in depth on the Book of Mormon and some of the other Mormon uh, scriptures, and we also d discussed their plan of salvation. Uh, so these classes are meant to build on each other. So uh, moving right along here, uh, let me get my screen, my slides right. All right, next slide. Uh, we start off by reminding everyone that God loves Mormons and God expects us to love them as well. I always want to... Uh, overstate the point that we're not here to degrade people or make fun of people. Uh, we're here to uh, confront false religions and hopefully lead people to Christ. All right, let's look at a couple Bible verses to get us started. Uh, the first one is when Jesus, all right, let there be light. I love it. <laughs> uh, when uh, Jesus was asked about the end times in Matthew 24, he said, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So that's one of the big the big indicators he talked about when he was discussing the end times. There's going to be lots of false prophets out there. And uh, in 2 Timothy, we see the Apostle Paul, an elder uh, pastor, was discipling a younger pastor, Timothy. He said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrines, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So keep that in mind, whether they're talking about Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or a whole bunch of other things we could be talking about. Um, we were warned that these things would be coming. All right, so in the po uh, polygamy, you might notice that guy, uh, Glenn Beck, uh, popular uh, media, political commentator, whatever. Um, he was asked, he's a Mormon, if you didn't know that, he's a Mormon. Uh, he became a Mormon uh, several years ago. Uh, he was asked about polygamy. He said it was a, a historical necessity. He said, I'm going to say no to the whole polygamy thing. It's a perversion of everything we believe in. The Mormons did practice it 122 years ago. Most of the men were dead. The families were ripped apart. They didn't have anything. There weren't a lot of dudes left. In total, only about 5% of the Mormons practiced polygamy. It was your duty to take care of your family. Uh, so he said it was uh, just a necessity, something that they had to do for a while. And this is what Mormons first told me when I, they first came to my door back in the 90s. And I didn't know anything. I didn't know what questions to ask him. I asked him about polygamy, and that's what, basically what they told me. He said, yeah, we practiced it for a while, but it was way back, back when there weren't enough guy, guys that not every, not every woman could have a husband, so some husbands would, would take, you know, take one for the team and take a second wife and take care of her so she could have a family too. And yeah, that's, that's what it was for. Um, it was never really part of a religion. We banned it years ago. It has nothing to do with our church. Uh, so that's kind of the answer you're going to get from a lot of Mormons today, uh, but we're going to see that's a lot more complicated than that. So first thing we got to get off is uh, the Book of Mormon does not teach polygamy, that the polygamy is okay. Uh, that's a big uh, misconception. In Jacob chapter 2, we see a couple verses. It says, Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable for me, saith the Lord. A few verses later, it says, Wherefore, my brethren, hear me and hearken to the word of the Lord, for there shall not be any man among you, save it be of one wife, and concubines he shall have none. So there you go, right? Polygamy is condemned by the Book of Mormon. Uh, but remember, the Book of Mormon was published in 1830. Joseph Smith died in 1844. A lot changed in those 14 years. Things changed actually very quickly. And when you make up a religion as you go, which is what I think happened, things change and you contradict yourself a lot over time. So this was an evolving concept. Um, in the early 1930s, Joseph began to secretly practice polygamy. Uh, there were allegations that he was committing adultery, and, but he came out and said that, no, that's not what's going on. And in what used to be Doctrine and Covenants, if you remember from earlier lesson, Mormons believe the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. 
in the Bible, kind of. Um, I got them all in this one book. Doctrine and Covenants is one of their other scriptures. The original Doctrine and Covenants, the 1835 edition, said, We declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman, but one husband. So there in 1835, they were still saying, Polygamy is wrong, even though it was secretly going on behind closed doors. This Doctrine and Covenants was replaced in 1872 with Doctrine and Covenants 132, which is what, is, uh, what they're publishing today, which allows polygamy. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Doctrine and Covenants 132, we looked at this the other week. Uh, it says, if any man, verse 61, if any man espouse a virgin and desire to espouse another, and the first give her consent, and if he espouse the second, and they are virgins, and vow to no other man, then he is justified. He cannot commit adultery, for they are given to him, for he cannot commit adultery with that which that belongeth to him and to none else. And if he has ten virgins unto, uh, given unto him by this law, he cannot commit adultery, for they belong to him, and they are given to him, therefore he is justified. So this is in their current Doctrine and Covenants 132, the one that they're publishing today, the one that they believe today. So what's interesting, in 1835, Doctrine and Covenants said, we condemn polygamy, but they were secretly practicing it. And now Doctrine and Covenants says, hey, it's okay under these conditions, but it has nothing to do with our religion. We don't do it. So it's kind of flip-flop here, uh, historically. Uh, as you can imagine, I think I covered this the other week, uh, Joseph knew that his first wife, Emma, uh, would not be too fond on this. Uh, so he addressed that as well. So what we just saw here is there were three rules laid down for polygamy. The first wife must give her consent. Uh, the wives must be virgins. And they must not be promised to another man. Uh, we're going to see Joseph Smith broke all three of those rules. And um, he did so consistently and uh, pretty boldly. So uh, if you back up about 10 verses in that same chapter, uh, it addresses his wife, first wife, Emma Smith. It says, let my handmaid Emma Smith receive all those that have been given unto my servant Joseph. And I command my handmaid Emma Smith to abide and to cleave unto my servant Joseph and to none else. But if she would not abide to the commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God, and I will destroy her if she abide not in my law. But if she will not abide in this commandment, then shall my servant Joseph do all things for her, even as he has said. And I will bless him and multiply him and give unto him a hundredfold in this world, fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, houses, land, wives and children, and crowns of eternal lives in the eternal world. So if Joseph, if his wife had a problem with it, here's a word from the Lord. I mean, how convenient is that? You know, you get a word from the Lord and then you get along with it, a word for your wife in case she has a hard time with it. So a lot of interesting things about this. Uh, Emma loved Joseph. Emma was convinced he was a prophet, was convinced he found the gold plates and everything, but she never was okay with this. Uh, she thought he was abusing his, his uh, role as a prophet by taking on multiple wives. Another interesting thing I, I think about, this is not my main point, but it says, if she abides not in this law, God will destroy her. I just find that interesting. What we talked about last week, they got three levels of heaven, and then they got the outer darkness, Destruction's nowhere in there. Where, where, where is it destroy in here? But that's what uh, comes out in Doctrine and Covenants. I think it's another um, <clears throat> contradiction. All right, so Fanny Alger, the first known uh, polygamy uh, um, partner he had, uh, she worked in his home as a teenager. She was a servant. And it uh, seems like he was having a longstanding uh, physical relationship with uh, Joseph, between Joseph and Fanny, and he was still married to Emma. Uh, as far as we can tell, there's been no record of a marriage ceremony. Uh, it was described by his cousin, Oliver Cowdery, as a dirty, nasty, filthy affair of his and Fanny Alger. Uh, but later on, it was kind of assumed that Fanny was his second wife. He said, no, 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 this is not adultery. This is polygamy. So it starts to evolve. Again, this is 1833, only three years after the Book of Mormon is published. So we see things started to change uh, pretty quickly. So uh, let's fast forward to 1838, uh, still were, uh, married to Emma, and now he's married also, quote unquote, to Fanny Alger, uh, never found a certificate, married this other woman, uh, Lucinda Pendleton, okay? So we're going to see each year he's, he's increasing his, uh, his amount of wives that he has. Fast forward to 1841, he marries a couple other women, uh, one of them named Zena is only 19, uh, he claimed an angel threatened his life if he would not marry her. So how would you like that? You know, prophet comes to you and says, not only do I want this to happen, but an angel is going to kill me if you don't go along with that. You know, 
that's abuse of power, to say the least. <laughs> to say it mildly, that's an abuse of power because, you know, she respects him as a prophet, and he's saying this, and she's feeling like, if I don't go along with this, the prophet's going to die. Uh, she married, he married another woman named Zena who was 20 and already married, and uh, he married uh, this other one, woman who was already married as well. So oftentimes what he would do, at least a couple times what he would do is, he would tell a man, God told me that you're supposed to take a mission trip to England or Canada. And then once he was gone, he'd move in on the wife and say, God told me that we're supposed to be married. So uh, he was a scoundrel. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. Uh, in 1842, he got really busy here. I got a list of five women that were single that he married. Uh, one of them was young as 17. I got a list of six uh, women that were already married that he took as wives. Um, he proposed to Nancy Rigdon. If you remember, Sidney Rigdon was his right-hand man. He was the fiery Campbellite revivalist preacher, uh, his running mate uh, when he ran for president. Uh, he never approved of polygamy, but uh, Joseph said, I'll propose to your wife. Also pro proposed to the wife of Orson Pratt. That was um, an apostle. We'll read from him later on. He was so depressed about it that he attempted suicide, that the prophet who he respected would try to take his wife. Um, three times he claimed the angel came to him with a drawn sword, said, you have to do this. He started performing secret ceremonies for um, his inner circle, Brigham Young. He's like, if I have to have a couple other wives, I'm going to have to have my inner circle do that uh, to make it look legit. So Brigham Young got an extra wife, um, but he denied it. He sent out missionaries saying that Mormons don't practice polygamy. Uh, it's a lie. So if you remember, he died in 1844. This is 1842. Each year... We're going to see he gets more and more wives, and I think that's interesting. Um, I, don't, he, I don't think he knew that he was going to die in 1844, but we'll get to 1844 in a second. 1843, he got really busy, took on 16 more wives, some of them already married. Um, the youngest one I see on this list is uh, 14, see 15, 16. This was not okay back then, you know. It's not, some people think, oh, back then you could marry young kids. No, this is not the 1300s, this is the 1800s, right? You couldn't marry 13-year-olds, that was not okay. Um, he would go to prison for that for sure today. Um, he performed a marriage uh, for uh, William Clayton to his wife's sister, uh, married two more women to Brigham Young, and he was sealed for eternity to his first wife, Emma. So this was a, a new thing. They believe that when you get married in a Mormon temple, you're sealed for eternity. You're going to be together after you die in, in the world to come. Uh, so this was something new, not taught in the Bible or the Book of Mormon. So, um, 1844, okay, this was a big year. I call it the Great Disappointment. Um, on April 11th, he, was, he anointed and ordained king, priest, and ruler over all Israel. So he gave new titles to himself. Uh, he, in May, he excommunicated William Law. William Law was his faithful follower up to the point, and then he, he was the guy who started the newspaper uh, that ex-Mormons were exposing what was going on. Um, and 26 May, he was still denying polygamy. He has boasted that he's done more than Jesus Christ as far as what he accomplished. On June the 7th of that year, he, um, the, the, the newspaper, the Nauvoo Expositor, exposed polygamy. And on June, uh, June the 10th, he orders the destruction, and a mob goes and destroys the press, throws it in the river. 18 June, he declared martial law because he wasn't mayor. And 24 June, he surrenders to his to authorities, and 27 June he was murdered in jail. So a big disappointment for Mormons. Uh, does anybody know anything else about 1844? Happen to know anything else? Might not a little trivia. So 1844 is called the Great Disappointment for another reason. It had nothing to do with Mormonism. There was another religious movement in America called the Millerites. It was led by a guy named William Miller. He, um, as far as I can tell, he was a fairly solid evangelical Christian, but he didn't believe the part of the Bible that says no one knows that when Christ is coming back. He thought he could do some calculations throughout the Bible, add up days in Daniel and equivalent days with years and figure it all up. And uh, he thought he could figure out that he originally said 1843. That didn't happen. So he said, wait a minute, hold on. We went back, recalculated, 1844. He said, 1844 is when, uh, is when the world, Jesus is coming back, it's all going to be over. He actually had a lot of followers. I mean, it was a big, big, big following. Uh, people stopped stop paying their bills, stop uh, taking care of the stuff. Um, they left their churches to go wait for Jesus to come back. They stopped taking care of their farms. They let their crops rot in the field. I mean, it was a big, big mess. And when that, nothing happened, uh, people were um, devastated. Some ended up in insane asylums. 
Um, William Miller said, hey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. Go back to your churches. The churches that said you were crazy, go back to them. Uh, some of them stayed together. I'm getting off track here, but some of them stayed together and recalculated, or re refigured up what was going on. And uh, that, that gave rise to uh, the Seventh-day Adventist movement and to the, um, to the Jehovah's Witnesses and some other, other groups. They said, well, maybe that wasn't the day of Christ's second coming, but it was the date of something else happening in heaven, Jesus going on to the next phase. So no connection to Mormonism there, but it was such a big deal, and they, they called it the Great Disappointment. I mean, Seventh-day Adventists, if you ask them about the Great Disappointment, they'll say 1844, that's when it happened. Um, but I think... Some have speculated, and I speculate, that Joseph Smith secretly believed in this prophecy. Even though he had no co connection to William Miller, he was thinking in the back of his head, 1844 could be it. That's why each year he gets more and more wives. He wants to have more and more wives for all eternity. That's why he gets so bold uh, in that last year of his life, you know, taking on more wives, declaring himself to be king, priest, ruler, um, you know, gives a speech about how you got, become gods. I think he was getting more bold because maybe in the back of his mind, he believed this prophecy from William Miller. But um, that's just some speculation. So um, he died in 1844. So some other things about polygamy. That's how it played out in Joseph Smith's life. This is Orson Pratt, the apostle. Um, this is the one who attempted suicide. He was so upset. He said, in heaven where our spirits were born, there are many gods, each of whom has his own wife or wives, which were given to him while yet in his mortal state. Um, now, you, you got to uh, take, um, this is a legit quote, but when you, when you share a quote like this with a Mormon, be prepared for their responses. Well, this is not canonized scripture. You know, this is not a quote from the Book of Mormon. This is not a quote from Doctrine and Covenants. This is just a quote from one of our apostles. Maybe he was just giving us his opinion. Now, I think it accurately rec represents what Mormonism teaches. It accurately represents what Joseph Smith taught and practiced. But they were always going to use that as kind of a cop-out. This is not canonized scripture. But it's good for reference right, regardless. Uh, another quote from Orson Pratt. Uh, it was about Jesus. He said, the great Messiah, who was the founder of the Christian religion, was a polygamist. We now are clearly shown that God the Father had a plurality of wives, one or more being in eternity and another being upon the earth. The Son followed the example of the Father and became a great bridegroom to whom the king's daughters and many honorable wives were, were to be married. Uh, we also have proved that both God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ inherit their wives in eternity as well as in time. Right. So when, you, when I see a quote like this, and I see a quote from Glenn Beck saying, well, it was just a necessity. They just had to do it. I'm like, no, that's not being honest with history. Maybe that's what he thinks. Maybe he's telling what he thinks is the truth. Uh, but that's not, that's not true to their history. So um, we talked about this before. There was a split. Uh, basically, Mormon, Mormonism today is in many, many, many different sects. But there's two basic families of Mormons. Those who practice polygamy, they follow Brigham Young out to Utah. Uh, those who rejected it, they stayed loyal to Emma Smith and, and his son, Joseph III, uh, back in Illinois. Um, so the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they were practicing polygamy. And what was called the reorganized Latter-day Saints, now the Community of Christ, uh, they rejected it. They denied that Joseph Smith ever practiced polygamy, and they blamed it all on Brigham Young. They said it was just a, just a nasty lie, something that he came up with. Um, our founder never practiced it. And poor Joseph III um, he was 11 when his dad died, I believe. I think he knew about polygamy, but his mom convinced him that it never happened, and he spent most of his life trying to prove to the world that his dad never practiced polygamy until closer to the end of his life. He finally, uh, I think he finally backed off on that, on that claim. So really, really unfortunate, really sad. Um, okay, here's the list of the Mormon presidents, and I'm talking about the, the main, the Salt Lake City Mormon presidents. I don't know if you can tell. I got, yeah, you can tell. I got them highlighted there. The first seven all practiced polygamy. Um, and that was a, the last one that practiced polygamy died in 1945. Um, since then, none of the Mormon presidents have um, practiced polygamy. But, you know, Joseph had 30 plus wives. 33 is a number that I hear a lot. Um, and this is something that the church, that the church acknowledges as of the last uh, seven or eight years. They actually came out and said, yes, we acknowledge he had all these wives. Whereas before they were in somewhat of denial. Brigham Young had 54 wives is a, is a number I heard. Yeah, yeah, pretty crazy. I read his biography a while back. It's, it's uh, pretty crazy. Uh, John Taylor, uh, he, was a, he was right there with Joseph Smith during the shootout. 
and he became president later on. He had several wives. He actually went into hiding because the federal government was after polygamist, and he basically spent his whole presidency in exile. Willard Wordworth, number four, uh, he issued a manifesto against polygamy. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And then a couple presidents later, they issued a second manifesto. So uh, a little bit more history. In 1882, uh, the United States passed the Edmonds Act. Uh, this was a federal statute declaring polygamy to be a felony. So if you were a polygamist, you didn't have the right to vote, you didn't have the right to serve on jury, uh, you couldn't hold political office. So it was a way to basically limit them from having too much influence. Uh, what is impressive is more than 1,300 men went to prison for polygamy. I mean, that's, to me, that's a big deal. I mean, I think we're all, you know, we're willing to be persecuted for our faith in Jesus Christ. If somebody said, we got to stop praying in Jesus' name or go to prison, I guess we're going to prison. But uh, this is bold. I mean, for polygamy, this is how strongly they believe this was God's will. It was not a historical necessity. Uh, they really, truly believed it was part of their religion. And uh, three uh, future LDS presidents uh, went to prison for that. Again, uh, Taylor was in exile. Uh, he issued a revelation in 1886, which said basically God's law can never change. We're practicing polygamy now, and it's going to be the law forever, and we're never going to change it because that would be changing God's law. We can't do that. Uh, we're going to see that they did do that uh, later on. So in 1890, we had the first manifesto. This is when the Mormon church is trying to get with the times a little bit. Uh, Utah wants to become a state. They know polygamy is a problem. So they want to at least uh, do something that makes it look like they're backing away from polygamy. Um, get, get the pressure off of them. So uh, he issued this manifesto, but it didn't really mean much. It was just, uh, it was just a piece of paper to most Mormons. If you had plural marriages, you didn't have to dissolve them. You didn't have to get rid of your, your extra wives. It advised against entering into a marriage. It was forbidden by the law. Uh, I like how it started. It said, to whom it may concern. Does that sound like a, a, the way a revelation from God should start? To whom it may concern. So <clears throat> most Mormons ignored it, and that was, that was the intent. They knew most Mormons would ignore it. But they hoped that it would at least buy them some kind of favor with society and with the federal government. So that was 1890. In 1904, President Joseph Fielding Smith, I believe he was cousin to the original, um, he issued his second manifesto. And this time they're getting more serious about it. Uh, this time they said, we're not going to sanction any more illegal marriages. Uh, we're going to excommunicate anybody who, who enters into a polygamous marriage. We're still not going to break them up. If you've got more than more, one wife, we're not going to make you dissolve it. Um, but this time they actually got a lot more serious about cracking down. A, a lot of Mormons still... still practiced it. This gave rise to the Mormon fundamentalist movement. Basically, some true believing Mormons said, hey, look, Joseph Smith restored the one true church. He practiced polygamy. Brigham Young practiced it. John Taylor practiced it. John Taylor said we could never get by without it. We're never going to change it. Uh, you guys change it. That means you guys aren't following God anymore. You're no longer the one true church on God's earth. Well, we're going to break away and our prophet's going to be the leader of the one true church. And then somebody broke away from that, and somebody broke away from that. So the Mormon fundamentalist uh, movement went off in many different directions. So in the 15 years following the second manifesto, many continued to practice, and some were excommunicated for it. In the 1920s, these ones that were ousted, they started to come together. And again, um, they, they believed that the keys of the kingdom had been taken away from the leadership in Salt Lake City and were given to uh, their prophet, who at the time was uh, Lawrence E. Woolley, and many other people have uh, made that claim since then. Uh, Mormon fundamentalist um, gave rise to many different branching sects. Um, the, the fundamentalist Church of Latter-day Saints, that's the big one. Uh, the Latter-day Church of Christ, the Apostolic United Brethren. Um, each of these branches has many people break off. Whenever you start a religion by breaking off from one religion, it's bound that somebody's going to break off from you and somebody's going to break off from that, and you're just going to have a numerous a different sects. So this is a guy named Warren Jeff. He's currently in prison. At one time, he was uh, one of the top ten on the FBI's most wanted list. Uh, he's still the leader of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, even though he's in prison. Uh, last I saw, he had nearly 80 wives. Many of them were under 17, so that's why he was... He was wanted by the FBI, not just for polygamy, but for child trafficking, right? Um, last I know, he was continuing to lead the church from a cell. He was making predictions of Armageddon. Um, so Mormons don't like this guy. I mean, they're not a fan of Warren Jeffs. They were embarrassed by him. They want 
people like this to, to go away. They're, they're giving mainstream Mormons a bad name. They're wanting to try to forget about their polygamous uh, past. Uh, but guys like this come along, you know, and they say, well, we had nothing to do with him. And I agree, they have, you know, they, they reject him, but who has more in common with Joseph Smith, this guy Warren Jeffs, or the current Mor president of the Mormon Church? I mean, Joseph Smith had 33 wives, 30-some, whatever, uh, many of them too young. He was on the run from the law. I'd say Warren Jeffs has more in common with Joseph Smith than uh, Russell Nelson, the current president of the Mormon Church. Um, but they, 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 they would uh, just assume these people not be around. Uh, so Polygamy in the Afterlife, this is a book called Mormon Doctrine. Again, not canonized scripture, but uh, something they would, do, they would use for teaching purposes. It says, plural marriage was openly taught and practiced until the year 1890, I would argue, Later than that. Obviously, the holy practice will commence again after the second coming of the Son of Man and ushering into the millennium. So, um, the real, the true believers in Mormonism, they say, yeah, polygamy is on hold for now. It's going to, we're not doing it right now because we can't, but it's still part of God's plan. All right. um, journal Discourses, uh, again, this is not canonized scripture, but Journal of Discourses is a collection of sermons, mostly by Brigham Young. He said this, now if any of you will deny the plurality of wives and continue to do so, I promise you that you'll be damned. And then he said, the only men who become gods, even the sons of gods, are those who enter in, into polygamy. So he did not just make this um, a practice or a, a historical necessity or something that uh, they had to do for a while. This was part of their gospel. This was part of their plan of salvation. This was part of their path to godhood. Um, so, you know, when Mormons say it has nothing to do with our religion, well, I have to say I'm sorry, but it does. It, it really does. Uh, okay, so what about the Bible? What does the Bible say about polygamy? Um, because they often bring up the point, well, why are you getting on us for Joseph Smith having wives? I mean, David had lots of wives. Solomon had lots of wives. Um, how many did Jacob have? You know, how many did Abraham have? You know, um, what, what's the big deal? So, you know, that's a fair question. And I got to thinking, let's go ahead. Is there any, any one place in the Bible that strictly forbids polygamy? I got to thinking, you know, it would be really easy to teach this class if there's just one verse that said, thou shalt not commit polygamy. That would make this class super easy. And I had to Google it and find out, see if anybody else came up with anything. And I think it was Mark Twain that came up with, with this in response to polygamy. It says, no man can serve two masters. <laughs> All right. Somebody got my joke for tonight. I want a joke. All right. So that's the closest I could come with a strict prohibition on, on polygamy. All right. So, um, but seriously, though, uh, moving on. Uh, what does the Bible say about polygamy? Well, like other sins, polygamy was practiced by some of God's people. You know, King David practiced polygamy. He also practiced murder and deception, right? Um, from the time of the flood to the time of the Babylonian captivity. We don't see polygamy in Noah's life or anybody before Noah. We don't see it any time after, you know, Daniel's life. So it was only a certain period of history, and it always caused problems. If you want to read about some dysfunctional families, go back and read about Jacob's family, you know. Go back and read about David's family and Solomon's. I mean, there are some messed up families. Just because they did it doesn't mean it was a good thing. Okay, so, next slide here. Um, here we go. It said it is, um, is not consistent with original creation, and I would argue that God created Adam and Eve. He didn't create Adam and Eve and Stephanie and, you know, Stacy and Laura and all these other women. Just... One man, one woman. So that's, a, that's the first hint we get that this is not God's plan, right? Um, and if you, if you see just the general population, you notice about half the, boys born, half the babies born are boys and about half of them are girls. So it kind of gives us a pretty good hint as what God's plan is, one, one for one. Uh, it's forbidden for kings. We're going to look at some of these verses, not all of them. Deuteronomy 17, 17 says kings are not to commit polygamy. Now we know some kings disobeyed that, and that caused some problems. It's strictly forbidden for leaders in the New Testament. And Timothy and Titus. And it's kind of assumed in other verses, which we're going to look at here. All right, let's look at Genesis 2.24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So, does it specifically forbid polygamy? Not 100%, but basically you get the point here. Got husband, wife, you know, one flesh. With polygamy, it gets a lot more complicated. 
All right, let's look at Ephesians in the New Testament. Ephesians 5, it says, Husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as, long, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So again, not a specific prohibition against polygamy, but it really kind of is. Because if the whole picture of marriage is supposed to be a picture of Christ and his church, uh, polygamy would mess that up. Polygamy would mess up that whole um, picture, that whole analogy. So I think polygamy really is, really is forbidden in Scripture when you look at it. Let's look at another one in 1 Corinthians. It says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to, to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. So it's just kind of assumed. You just got one wife, one husband. Uh, that's the way it works in marriage. Pretty straightforward, right? Let's look what the Bible does not do. So the Bible does not endorse polygamy. Even though it records it several times, it never says it's a good thing. It never enforces polygamy with sword-wielding angels. You know, yes, David took lots of wives, but he never said, oh, an angel appeared to me and told me if I'm going to die if I don't take this wife. Uh, he never said it was part of, uh, part of the gospel, a part of the plan of salvation, or, or God needs me to do this so I can progress. That's never, never in the Bible. It does never allow a man to marry a married woman. you never see that approved of in the Bible. Uh, it does not allow for women to have multiple husbands. Here's a, uh, the kind of the flip side of it. If you've got a 50-50 population and one guy has more than one wife, some of those wives are going to have more than one husband for it to work, right? Um, you never see that approved of in the Bible, ever. Uh, it does not endorse secret marriages. We saw um, Joseph Smith was doing secret marriages. Marriages were always a, pu a public thing. And it does not teach that marriage is just for time and eternity. That may sound uh, poetic and romantic, but that's not what the Bible teaches. It says in, uh, in the resurrection, we'll be like the angels, neither marrying or being given in marriage. Uh, so, um, yes, you see polygamy in the Bible, but not the way the Mormons would like to pretend it's in there. All right, let's look at one more verse here before I finish up. John 10.10, 10. it says, The thief come not, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Uh, polygamy is a tool of the enemy who comes to steal and destroy. Um, many marriages, many families have been wrecked by polygamy. It continues to happen today. If you know anything about what's going on out in the western United States and these polygamous fundamentalist groups, um, it's awful. I mean, young women are still being basically forced into marriage with older men who have several wives already. And it's slavery. I mean, there's no other nicer way to put it in some cases. Um, this is a tool of the enemy. Um, it mars the image of God. It mars something um, beautiful that God created uh, in marriage. And it is definitely a tool of the enemy. So was polygamy a, uh, a historical necessity? Not really. It was part of their belief system. It was part of their gospel. They can say we don't believe it anymore. They can say we get excommunicated if we do it, but it's still part of the fundamental belief system. And many Mormons today, if they, if they start becoming more devout, I want to be a better Mormon, so I'm going to go back and read the writings of Brigham Young and John Taylor and these early Mormon apostles and prophets. And A lot of times they end up becoming polygamists and joining these fundamentalist sects because they think that's the way to be a, be a true Mormon. So... All right, so the recommended reading, I, I modify it just a little bit. Uh, the top one is called What, what Love Is This TV? Um, that is a, it specifically addresses polygamy, Mormon polygamy. It's run by a woman who was a, who was a victim, a member of a polygamous cult, and she later on escaped, found Jesus Christ, and now runs a ministry, makes videos uh, trying to rescue people from Mormonism in general, but specifically um, the fundamentalist Mormons.
Mormonism. Um, also on the free videos on YouTube, you can look at the Lifting the Veil of Polygamy. That's a video basically showing her testimony and other testimonies and, and discussing this controversy. So highly recommend all these videos, but that one in particular for tonight. And of course, my YouTube channel is up there. You can get on there if you want to rewatch this video, if you want to go back and watch the ones you missed. Or if you want to watch my class on Islam or part of my class on Catholicism and some of my sermons I've preached at other churches, they're all on my YouTube channel. So subscribe to my YouTube channel. I think I got three subscribers now, so, you know, <laughs> help me out if you want to. But anyways, uh, the next lesson, we're going to talk about who was Joseph Smith, get more into uh, his life and the, the controversies uh, surrounding him personally. Okay, so that is all the um, that is all the material I have for tonight. Let me go ahead and close us in prayer, and then we'll have time for some questions. Uh, Father God, thank you once again for the opportunity uh, to come together and talk about uh, the truth and talk about how the truth differs from uh, what is not true, what is evil. Lord, help us to be loving as gracious and gracious as we expose the lies, but also help us to be bold and uncompromising as we uh, expose the lies of the enemy, expose the lies of the thief who comes to, to steal, to kill, and destroy, Lord, as we lift up you as our glorious Lord and Savior. I look to your word for continual truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the microphone is set up. You have to approach if you want to ask a question tonight. So. <laughs> okay. Am I on? Okay. You're on. So... Canonized scripture. Yes. I have no idea what that means when you're talking about it in regards to Mormon. Okay. Um, so explain that because with the Bible, canonization was an incredibly Whoa. large and massive undertaking and a huge deal. So right. Okay. Who canonized it and what does that mean? Okay. So the canonized scripture um, are the, the scriptures I talked about earlier when they, they believe the Bible insofar as it's translated correctly. Um, they publish the King James Bible, although they believe that's corrupt, but they use the Joseph Smith translation many too. And they use the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. So those are their canonized scriptures. But what did that, how did they canonize it? Who canonized it? What did hmm. canonization mean to them? That's what I'm saying. In oh, that's a good question. Bible, that's a yeah. huge undertaking of studying the the process, and, yeah. Oh, a huge there process. Wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like that. I, I, I don't know exactly at what point they said, what prophet said, these are our, our books or not. But so it was not a process like what you're thinking. It's not a process like what we were okay. thinking about, where they poured over the Old Testament, New Testament, and looked right. at the manuscript. They didn't do that. Okay. Some, some prophet somewhere along the, along the line said, these are the books that we believe are, are inspired. So that's what I wanted to get at. Because yeah. I figure somebody else may have that. Their, their idea of canonization is not really what canonization is a, a thorough process of bringing into making a yeah. publication like the Bible. Yeah, so, if, it's, if it's done right. I think can, the word canon just means like rule or standard or whatever. It so this, so it just means this is their standard. standard. Right. They didn't come to the standard the same way Christians came okay. to, but this is their standard. However okay. they got there, that's what it is. Okay, great. Yeah, thank that you. That answers that. Yeah. And then so the people that don't practice the polygamy, from what I'm hearing tonight, and maybe I'm off on this, maybe you can set me straight. To me, it really is has come down to um, they can't because of laws that are in practice. And so, like you said, those people that are wild and oh, going off on their own, the fundamentalists and everything, yeah. they're doing it. The people that are saying that they don't and even trying to say it's not part of their history, is that truly probably just because of the law? I think it's a mix. I think, I, I think the, to the true believers, yes. But I think at this point in 2021, there's been so many generations of Mormons that have been told, we don't do that anymore. It's not part of our law. Our prophets don't want us doing that. That they really think they're not supposed to be doing it. Okay. But the ones who are true believers and dig back into their, their history a little bit more, they come to an understanding that, yeah, if it was legal, we'd still be doing this. Yeah. And then the, I'm still just floored at how it wasn't even in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and here we are a few yeah. years down the road. Yes. And then to say then, even either way at that point when it's that messed up, to say it is part of our 
history in the canonized right. scripture <laughs> isn't accurate. But right. then to say that it is isn't, isn't when it was practiced by, like you said, the first seven. Yeah. I mean, to me, wow. Yeah, it, it floors me too. They, they don't view scripture the way we do. I mean, is, is the best way I can answer it. I mean, they got their scripture, but they got their prophet. <laughs> you know, if their prophet says something, then it doesn't really matter what scripture a long time ago says. They can hold up a Book of Mormon and say, this is the correct book on earth, most correct book on earth, but as soon as you show them it contradicts their prophet, they're like, well, that's why we have a prophet, you know, to clarify things for us, and we've got to obey the prophet. <laughs> you know, so that's not how Christians should handle the word of God, but that's often how Mormons uh, handle their scripture. And, you know, you sparked a thought in my mind that I, I'd had before, and I think this all started when he, when he was cheating on his wife with Fanny Alger, that little teenage servant of his. And I think he didn't want to admit that it was adultery. I think he had to come up with an excuse and said, no, 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 this, uh, the Lord told me to take her as a wife. And then once he got away with that, he decided to take another wife. And then this whole movement took off and these new scriptures were formed and guys have 54 wives and these denominations are formed. And it's like, all because a guy was cheating on his wife. <laughs> it's crazy. So what else? Good questions. All right, Pastor. Bring one up here. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you touched on it. I was answering some questions as we were going along. So yeah. uh, ultimately, what was the purpose of having multiple wives? Did you address that during the talk? Uh, I don't think I did. Um, it's complicated. What's the purpose of it? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, part of it is to populate all these extra planets that are out there. I mean, if you're going to be a god <laughs> of your own planet, and you only have one wife, it's going to be hard to populate the planets. Um, and part of it, hey, if God, that's what God's doing, we have to follow in his. It's a good question. What exactly is the purpose of it? Yeah, the, the other yeah. uh, extent, because I knew that yeah. was one of the, yeah. the thoughts was, um, when did the teaching of populating other planets, and, and I know, and when did that come into play as opposed to when the things were written? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, so I know the Book of Mormon was published 1830, and no other planets being populated the, at that point. Right. But then by 1844, I would say that probably was around the time when the um, Book of Abraham was published, which I think was 1836-ish. So that didn't really talk about populating other planets. That's the first time it said Council of the Gods. That's the first time it said... Um, God lives near the star or planet Kolob and weird stuff like that. So I would say mid-30s, but I can't give an exact date. I don't sure. know. It's really confusing. Okay. <laughs> oh, good questions, though. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, any more questions from uh, online? Go ahead and Pastor will get them to me. Cool. All right. Well, I guess I guess we're complete. Uh, like I said, next week we're going to be talking about the life of Joseph Smith. And then after that, I believe we're going to talk about some uh, unique Mormon doctrines. And we're going to finish, I think, with uh, temple rituals, the Mormon temple rituals. So thank you all for participating. See you next week. Bye.